So what does innovation mean? It means, as I was just saying, creating the new ideas, but actually making something commercial of them to make the world a better place and to make the company a better place as well. And that whole innovation, which is a very trendy buzzword, is something that countries are focusing on. Uh, there are many ways that countries will try and attract that sort of innovative activity or R&D, whatever we call it, to their jurisdictions. Uh, and my area is quite limited in terms of the range of incentives they can offer, but my area is to deal with the tax-based incentives that are on offer in now about 40 countries around the world. Uh, and most of these, to pick up on, there was a point made about innovation being more than just technology. Most of the tax-based incentives are focused on technology. Uh, and as I say, there are 40 schemes around the world, and, and this is becoming an increasingly competitive market. Uh, France, quite recently, in about the last four years, substantially improved its regime, where it now offers a 30, that's 30% credit against tax for costs associated with technological innovation, and that's put them really at the forefront of the world in that area. We've had new regimes started in a, a lot of countries in this region, Croatia, Czech Republic, Hungary, the relatively new entrants, further afield, South Africa, and uh, say France has increased theirs, Germany is looking at introducing a regime. So this is a really competitive market. And governments generally are, are quite receptive and believing of the fact that bringing this sort of activity into their country does produce spin-off economic benefits in terms of the knowledge base that's generated there. Actually measuring and proving that could probably be the focus of a two-day conference in itself with a whole bunch of economists. It is very difficult to tie the two down, but studies have been done. There was one in the UK uh, in 2006, which is available on the, the UK government websites, where they looked principally at the US and Canada. And the general trend where these regimes have been in place does seem to suggest that incentivizing R&D in this way does promote the actual undertaking of R&D in the country, so there is something there. But what's, uh, what is interesting is the way different countries focus on it and the different way they interpret their R&D incentives. Uh, and some of the key points I would say that countries sometimes stumble on and sometimes are successful on is, is actually thinking in advance about what they want to achieve. So are they looking to encourage innovation and R&D in small companies, sort of university spin-outs and so on that will generate ideas? Or are they trying to encourage large companies to actually bring their R&D functions to a country and actually invest in the country, create the jobs? And this comes back to the point I made earlier about the UK having lots of ideas but not seeing them through commercially. I think having the ideas people does create some jobs, but taking that next step of commercializing something into a viable economic product is where the real activity and where the jobs are. And a lot of regimes, they talk about uh, rewarding research and development, and in practice they tend to focus more towards the research side of it and not the developmental side, and that's a shame because I think that's where the bigger benefits can come through. Uh, there's also uh, conflicts which we've had in the UK about whether the regime was there to actually provide companies with some form of compensation for undertaking an activity that they otherwise get no immediate economic reward for, or whether it's there to actually encourage them to take a bit of risk and to try something new, and to try whether it's processing a new type of crude in their refinery, or try launching a new product or a new food substance with, with less salt, less fat, whatever it is. Uh, and, and that's caused some conflicts. The government's moved towards the research end and towards the, um, the pure reward for failure. So if companies do take the risk and undertake R&D, they don't pick up the reward. Uh, in other countries where they do get the reward for taking the risk, even if successful, it actually encourages more of that developmental approach. Uh, another interesting fact, in terms of thinking about what you mean by research and development, a lot of countries struggle with banks. So it's interesting to hear my <laughs> colleagues' comments here. Uh, when they say we introduced a, a regime to encourage research and development, and then they receive a claim for a large tax rebate from a bank, they say, well, what, you know, what's going on here? Banks don't do R&D. But actually, if you look, certainly in London, at what the large banks are doing in Canary Wharf, they have huge teams of IT professionals who are really pushing the borders of IT development. And that is exactly what the regime was heralded as, as being there to introduce, to encourage these sort of people to be in the UK doing that work. And it's a great shame when they don't acknowledge that. 
Uh, that, that seems to be happening in certainly the UK, the US, Canada, France and Australia, which are the main larger countries with longer standing regimes. They have accepted banks into the fold and do reward them for their R&D. I've been working with our practices in some of the Central Europe countries, Croatia, Czech Republic, and they're just at that phase where they're, they're at that point where the governments realise claims are coming in from banks and thinking, is this right? And we're having to talk them through what's actually going on and showing the level of innovation in this IT development, which is precisely what they're looking for. So actually getting those sort of factors in place before you put a regime in and thinking about what you want to reward, making sure that you're actually delivering the right sort of benefit to the right sort of activities at the right sort of level of value is very important. And just on that level of value, one point where certainly the UK falls down uh, and quite a lot of other countries is one of the UK's issues is to try and boost our manufacturing industry where we were very successful a long time ago and we've moved more to services and financial services. But our R&D regime, whilst it's quite generous, it only provides you with additional tax deductions. So if you're a loss-making company like 90% of our manufacturing industry is, you get no immediate benefit. And actually when you're loss-making, that is the time when you really want to encourage R&D to create those new products to bring the business back out of loss and out of recession. Uh, other countries, France, as I mentioned earlier, has this 30% credit which is actually refundable for loss-makers. In Belgium and the Netherlands, they have a slightly different regime based more around a wage tax incentive. So the, the wages of people who are engaged in undertaking R&D work, they receive a rebate of, sort of 10 to 17 percent of their social security costs. Uh, and that obviously comes through regardless of whether on, on a tax basis the company is making a profit or loss. The other advantage of those regimes in Belgium and the Netherlands is because it's a rebate of, of social security costs, it's actually an above the line benefit. Most companies measure their success and certainly people within the company are incentivized on profit before tax. And if your incentive is purely based on tax deductions, so you receive it as a reduction in your tax bill, it becomes less of a direct incentive to the people in the business who are undertaking that work. Uh, and that's when, again, you, you, you get into criticism from the government that actually this isn't seen as something that's driving R&D. It's seen as something that's used by head office to boost the coffers uh, and save on the tax bill, which doesn't quite hit the mark of what the government was aiming for. So lots of regimes out there all have their, their different, slightly different approaches. None of them are perfect, I would say. Uh, in terms of where the trend is going, I've talked about a few that have recently introduced them. Generally, the trend is to introduce new regimes or to improve regimes. Uh, the U.S. announced this week, Obama has um, stated that he wants to make the U.S. R&D credit a, a permanent fixture. It's always been a temporary relief, but he sees that as a core part of his job creation strategy. In the U.K., we're just going through debate because we had a change of government, and the new government isn't entirely clear how this R&D system works and what it should do. Australia has also had a change of government, but both parties were keen to retain the regime. They just had very different ideas about how it would operate. Uh, and the, the real um, unusual case is New Zealand, which introduced a regime two or three years ago uh, and then had a change of government within six months and the new government abolished it. So they had a regime for one year and then it went. But that is very unusual. That bucks the trend in most countries. Uh, it's never perfect, and I say a range of many options, but tax-based incentives are seen as a, a growing and increasing way to encourage R&D activity. I would say uh, three things are important in what I'm talking about, which is a, a tax credit-based system. The first thing is relevance in terms of both the types of activities that you're trying to encourage. As I say, the more you focus on research, the more it really becomes just about the life sciences and pharmaceutical industry. So you have to make it relevant to a wide range of businesses in terms of the activities and also to the level of benefit. Uh, Korea is a good example which has a, a net benefit of its R&D regime of about three to four and a half percent, which doesn't excite many businesses in terms of that's a great location to go to. France at 30 percent does cause that sort of level of excitement and that's quite a tough call for governments because that's a big commitment then uh, and they have to be sure that's going to work. Uh, the second point is ease of use. Uh, that there's a risk of me talking myself out of a job here but um, Thankfully, I can rest assured that governments never do anything simply, 
but actually the best thing for businesses that they could do is make an R&D regime as simple to operate as possible so that companies understand what they have to do, they understand the claim procedure, and it's relatively smooth and easy for them. Mm. And the final point is, is certainty and consistency. People will only invest in a company based on a, on a regime such as this if they believe it's there to stay and they believe that the practice, i.e. the way it's regulated by the tax authorities, will match what the promise is. And so there needs to be that linkage there.